Okay, I think we're ready to begin this morning. So if you can find your seats, we love that you're visiting, but we're ready to start. <laughs> um, welcome this morning. Glad to see you guys here. We had an amazing Easter service last week. Our, we were full um, in all, most of our seats, so invite those people back. <laughs> so we'd love to have, have them and um, your friends and neighbors. So invite, invite, invite. And we're so glad Jesse's back. Yay. Doesn't this look like this is an amazing worship team <laughs> sitting up and standing up here. Super blessed to have them. Um, so again, just welcome this morning. Um, thank you for your faithfulness and um, in attendance and in giving back and your tithes and offerings. Um, just remember, we have the wooden church there. We have the online codes. You can go to Redland Church of the Nazarene. I think if you put in .org, .com, .net, they'll all pop up. Um, so really easy to give there. Um, Sunday school class, our small groups after. Um, just make sure that you join us because that, I think everybody's sitting in here, um, except for we have new visitors that, um, that, that uh, oh, Paul's kind of looking at me, that we all um, went to high school with um, a long, long time ago. <laughs> and um, <laughs> so anyway, glad to have them. And just, oh, my mother said she went to high school with his mother. <laughs> wow. So glad to have them. <laughs> and um, anyway, just in, enjoy the morning of worship. Wednesday morning is our Facebook um, pastor does our devotion on Wednesday morning. So make sure that you log into that and then just join us for our small groups. And with that, we're going to turn it over to our worship team. Yes, good morning. Let's all stand up. Let's lift our voices to our Lord and Savior. Let's go. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show. here last Sunday or wherever you were, it was Easter Sunday, and that was a beautiful reminder, as we should remember every day, of why we're here in church, right? Um, we have our Bibles, but it's because of the resurrection, right? Yes. He went to the cross for us on our behalf, and because of that love, we now have eternal life as well. So we're going to sing about that now in this next song. Thank you. 
Lord, I come to you. Let my heart be changed, renewed, flowing from the grace that I found in you. Lord, I've come to know the weaknesses I see. stripped away by the power of your love hold me close let your love surround me and bring
Cause Jesus paid it all All to Him I owe Sin had left a crimson stain He washed it white as snow spots and melt the heart of stone cause Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow oh, sin left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow he washed it white as snow yes he washed it white as snow Father, we thank you for that promise that even when we don't feel worthy or we feel like we don't deserve your love, you remind us that Jesus was enough. That you gave your one and only son for us. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We praise you, Father, for your love, your love that is sometimes indescribable, but if there's words we could use, sometimes a little reckless, because there's times where we try and run and we try and run away from you, yet you chase us down, and time and time again, your grace abounds in our life and you're always there to welcome us. So Father, I pray in this time 
there's things on our hearts and our minds, any burdens, things that are weighing us down, I pray we leave them right here, right now. Let your peace that surpasses all understanding fill our hearts and our spirits. spoke a word you were singing over me you have been so so good to me for I took a breath you breathed your life in me you have been so so kind to me. So the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. And I couldn't earn it, and I don't deserve it. Still, you yourself away oh the overwhelming never ending reckless love of God
chorus one more time. Let's hear from you today. Uh, can you just give a one or two word praise to God this morning? And we're going to start with Dolores. Oh. <laughs> you know, I never can say just one or two words. Oh, that's okay. We'll let you say three. Yeah. Well, you know, last time you opened it up to, um, to ask us what we thought. Good Friday, yeah. Amen. And yet he still, he still loves us. He still asks forgiveness. Amen. And so no matter what we are going through, what sadness, what troubles we're going through, God allowed Jesus to show us that he, he suffered it all and we can surely go through what we go through. And it's yes. Good Friday is a special, special day to me. Amen. Okay. <laughs> Who'll be next? Just a couple words. Like, like, thank God for his mercy. Something like that. Yes. We got someone standing up back here. She must. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Wow. There you go. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. All right. Keep those grandkids coming. Yes. <laughs> All right. Wow. Yes, amen. Praise God. Thank you for sharing all those things. Yes. Amen. <laughs> praise, praise the Lord. Someone else. I can call on any of you. You know that. I thank God for undeserved favor. Yes, amen. Amen. Yes, his faithfulness. You know, we never hear anything from Paul because Paul sits back there in the corner. How about it, Paul? What are you grateful for? Amen. That covers a lot, doesn't it? Amen. Praise the Lord. Did you hear that, Charmaine? He confessed. He confessed that. <laughs> Amen. Wow. God is good. Hey, there's a big race today up in Alabama. They say, they call it Talladega, but it's actually in a little town called Lincoln, Alabama. It's where the raceway is. And uh, so there's a big race there. Uh, this must be the season for races. Uh, there's a big horse race 
uh, next week uh, up in Louisville, Kentucky. You ever heard of that? The Derby, <laughs> Churchill Downs. So a lot of racing going on. The most important race is the race that you're running right now. Did you know that you're running a race? Yeah, it's called, it's called life. <laughs> it's called life. And uh, that, that's the most important race. Um, it's, it, it feels like a race against time, right? <laughs> but it's a race for time and eternity. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 13, um, he said that everyone can win this race that you're running. You don't win because you're the fastest or you have a really great and awesome moment while you're running the race. Uh, you, it's not because you shine for a day. But the way you win this race is you finish. You just keep running till the end. Now, for someone like me, that, that, that's encouraging. That I know I'm not the fastest guy on the block. And uh, n never was, never will be. <laughs> but all I have to do is finish. All I have to do is stay in the race. Uh, the Apostle Paul, when he finished uh, his life, when he was at the end of his life, he said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And I trust today that you're, you're in it to win it because you're going to finish. You may have to have some help being dragged over the finish line, but you're going to finish. Amen? So the disciples, after the resurrection, were about to begin the race of their lives. They didn't know what was involved. They didn't even know they were ready. <laughs> but Jesus did because he had trained them he had discipled them for three and a half years, and they, did, they didn't get the resurrection thing yet completely. They, 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 had, they had been convinced by now, um, a week and a half after the resurrection, that yes, he indeed died and rose from the dead. And, and, and something is, something is going to happen. Uh, what is it? What, what's, what's next? And that's the title of my sermon. Um, that's the question after Easter Sunday, uh, not only for the pastor who's trying to prepare a sermon, but for you who are living beyond Easter Sunday, what's next? I asked Dan on the way in the door this morning, I shook his hand and I said, well, what's next, Dan? And he said, Oh, my, does there have to be a next? <laughs> and I think if we're honest, we all would probably identify with the feeling. Oh, I, 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 does there have to be a next? Well, there is a next. Because after the resurrection of Jesus, uh, everything changed. Nothing was the same. Life as the disciples uh, and the followers of Jesus' life as they knew it had changed forever. There's uh, the, 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 the interesting reading in the scripture of the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus um, have, to be, have to be looked at today because in order for us to answer the question, what is next for us, uh, what is next for the church, uh, we need to look uh, we need to look quickly and uh, we need kind of a bird's eye view of what happened after the resurrection and before Pentecost. And there were three really important events that happened after the resurrection and, after, uh, and during these resurrection, post-resurrection appearances of Jesus. You see, in John chapter 20, uh, verse 19... Uh, on the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, 
Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Uh, that was one of the first appearances of Jesus after the resurrection. He rose from the grave early Sunday morning, and by Sunday evening, uh, he, he just he walks through the walls or the doors that were tightly fastened because the disciples thought they crucified Jesus. Next, they're looking for us. We're, we're next on the list. So they were, they were frightened, and they were behind locked doors. But Jesus just, in his, in his post-resurrection body, he just kind of makes his way through the walls, and he appears before the disciples. And, and I, I'm sure they were probably frightened. And, and he said, peace be with you. Jesus was appearing to his disciples in order to convince them that he not only rose from the dead, uh, that he's had a tremendous change uh, in, his, in his physical body, but he's the same Jesus. He's still fully human and fully d- divine. He's, he, he has this, this new kind of resurrection body that can go wherever he wants. He can walk through walls, uh, but he's still eating uh, and drinking. Uh, that's one way he convinces them that, that he rose from the dead. He says, give, give me a piece of fish or give me a piece of bread. Watch me eat this. Um, and, and so he, he made these appearances to, uh, to convince his disciples that he was the same Jesus, but he was he had risen from the dead and he had a resurrection body. Uh, in John chapter 20, verse 26, he appears again a week later. It, the scripture says a week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with him. Thomas was not with them in the first appearance, but Thomas is with them in this appearance. And again, the doors were locked um, Jesus appears um, to them again in the same manner that he had before, but this time he's kind of after Thomas. He's kind of after the one that they referred to, or he got the nickname Doubting Thomas. And uh, I like to call him Honest Thomas because that's really all it was. He was just being honest. Uh, There were certain things that he wasn't going to believe until he saw it. He was kind of a scientific kind of guy. You know, I, I want to see it to believe it. Uh, show me the science. Uh, and, and Jesus did show him the, sci- the science. Uh, the sci- science of his nail-pierced hands and his wounded side. And when Thomas saw that, he was convinced. He just, he just fell at the feet of Jesus and said, my Lord and my God. Um, the third appearance is in John chapter 21. The scripture says that that Peter, Thomas, James, and John, and two other disciples decided to go out fishing. Uh, Now, there's some people that make a big deal out of Peter saying, I'm going to go fishing. There are some who say that he he, he backslid and he he decided to go back to the fishing business. I I don't see that. I don't read that into this story necessarily. Uh, I think that Peter probably was bored, didn't know what to do with himself. And he just said, hey, guys, I'm going to go out fishing for the night. And they said, we're coming with you. <laughs> and so, so they went out on this, um, this, this all-night fishing expedition. And uh, early in the morning, there was, there was this man on the beach who, who saw them coming in uh, without any fish. And like, like you do when you're out with other fishermen, uh, or individuals fishing, you just say, you caught anything yet? And Jesus yelled out, catch any fish? They said, no, nope. we've been fishing all night. We haven't caught a fish. And when, when John heard Jesus' voice, he recognized it was the Lord. And he said, that's the Lord. And when, when John said that, Peter jumps over the side of the boat and he gathers his garments and he starts wading in the shallow water Uh, to where Jesus was. And Jesus says, cast your nets on the other side. Cast your nets on the right side of the boat and see what happens. And they did. And they caught 153 large fish. John records the number of fish 
and the size of the fish. I'd say he had done some fishing. And uh, in order to get it accurate, uh, he, he records 150, is it two or three? Uh, I kind of lost track. But 150 some fish, and they were large fish. And uh, it, it was difficult to get the net in the boat. So they drag the net up on the shore, and they all just leave the fish jumping and flopping and dangling in the nets, and they run up to where Jesus is. Jesus has prepared a fire of coals on the beach. Now, you know, I think the fire of coals on the beach was a reminder for one particular disciple, and that was for Peter. You know why? Because it was beside a fire of coals that Peter, uh, just a few days prior to that, denied the Lord three times. The scripture says that people were warming their hands by this fire, and there was a little girl, probably middle-aged uh, girl, who who was standing there, and she said, oh, you, you, you sound like and look like you're one of Christ's followers. And Peter denied that he was one of Christ's followers. And she said it again and said, your, 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 your dialect kind of gives you away. You must be one of the followers of Jesus. And he, and, he, and he said, no, I am not. I do not know him. And then the third time that he denied the Lord, the scripture says that he swore. I don't know what he said. But he was emphatic in his denial of Jesus. So, so th they're coming to this little, this little campfire that Jesus has on the beach. And Jesus invites them to breakfast. And it's significant to me that it says that Jesus gave them bread. Uh, it, it, was common, it was a common tradition for Jesus to break bread like he did at the Last Supper. He broke the bread. And there was another time after Jesus rose from the dead that he broke the bread. Remember he was walking along that Emmaus road with those disciples who were talking about the crucifixion of Jesus like in past tense. And Jesus kind of walks up with them. Probably one of those times where he just like appears. And he's walking along with them and he's saying, well, well, tell me about this person that died. Um, what, what, what's the deal? And, and so, so they go over with Jesus all the things that have happened to Jesus, not knowing it was Jesus. And John records that, that while they were walking, there was something going on in their hearts. Their hearts were burning within them because they didn't know it, but it was Jesus who was walking with them. And so when they get to their house, um, you know, you would think that they would just uh, give pleasantries and say, well, you have a nice evening. Uh, but they invited Jesus in. They said, no, don't leave us. C come on in and spend the evening with us. And Jesus goes in. They still don't know who he is. But the scripture says that they sat down at the table and Jesus broke bread and gave it to them. And when he did, they recognized him. You know what I think they recognized? His nail-pierced hands. This was the crucified Lord. They had seen him break bread before. But his hands were different this time that he broke bread. And when he broke bread on that beach and passed the bread out and the fish that he had cooked, they knew it was Jesus. The times before, they asked, who is this? Who are you? This time on the beach, there was no asking. They knew. They had heard his voice. They had seen his hands. He had just served them bread and fish. And it's interesting that I think Peter was probably thinking, oh, man, I need to apologize how can I bring this up? And, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe he's going to say something first. Maybe I, should, maybe I should wait this time instead of just blurting something out. And, and, and there was a moment of hesitation. And, 
and, and, and suddenly Jesus begins the conversation and, uh, and, and, and Jesus says, hey, Peter, do you love me more than all of these? Now, I think Jesus gestured when he said, do you love me more than these? I think he gestured toward the fish, toward the fishing boats, toward the nets, to the fish that were still probably flopping and dangling in the nets because 153 large fish converted into Peter's mind and the other fishermen there into dollar signs. Do you love me more than these? And Peter said, yes, Lord. I love you more than these. And Jesus wasn't satisfied with, with just one response. This is in John chapter 21, if you want to look that up in your scriptures. So he said again, after Peter said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, well, then feed my lambs. He was talking about Peter taking care of, of the church. He was talking about Peter's calling, not only to follow Jesus, but to preach and to serve the flock. So when, when Peter said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you, Jesus said, feed my lambs. And then he said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He asked that the second time. And he answered again, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. First he said lambs, then he says sheep. And then a third time Jesus says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? At this time, the third time, Peter was offended. And he was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said the third time, Lord, you know all things. In other words, he said, Lord, you know what's in my heart. And I do love you. You know that I love you. And then Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you to where you do not want to go. What Jesus was saying to Peter was he was foretelling the manner in which, G uh, in which Peter would be martyred for the sake of the gospel. Peter didn't have any idea what Jesus was saying. And so Peter kind of didn't know what to say next and he was lost for words and 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 and, and he uh, he he turned and pointed to John and he said to Jesus well, what about him <laughs> what about this guy what about the one you love <laughs> and Jesus said what's it to you if he lives and never dies what you need to do Peter is follow me. You need to focus on following me. And that's a wonderful lesson for all of us. We have a tendency to compare ourselves to other people. And especially when someone seems to get by with something that we can't get by with, we say, well, what about him, Lord? <laughs> what about her? She she seemed to get by with that, and, and, and you know, I, I could never get by with that. I, I, I could never live my Christian life that way. Uh, how, how does he or how does she uh, claim to be a Christian and, and still able to do that or go there or, or live that way? And we're always getting the focus off of us following Jesus. And what, what was next for Peter and all of those disciples was a restoration of their love and their trust with Jesus. You see, all of them fled. All of them abandoned Jesus at the cross, not just Peter. But they all fled in fear. And when Mary came to them and said, 
I've gone to the tomb and, and he's not there. Uh, maybe someone has taken his body. Uh, Peter and John took off in a foot race to the tomb. And it wasn't immediate. It wasn't, uh, it, it wasn't at the very moment that they saw that they believed. But, but they saw and then they contemplated. They thought in their minds, could this be true? And over the next few hours, they became convinced of, of, of the resurrection of Jesus. There had to be a reconciliation and a restoration of trust. And Jesus got right to the crux of the trust issue when he asked Peter, who had denied him three times, three times, do you love me? Because that's the core issue when we have trouble with trusting God is love. He not only restored the trust and the love, but he restored Peter's calling. He restored the followership. Remember, we used that word a couple of weeks ago. He restored the followership of Peter because that's what Jesus initially said to Peter. Remember, when, when he originally called him, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So he restored his followership and he reminded Peter in this moment, don't be worried about John or any of the other 11, but you, Peter, focus on following me. I think that's what Paul meant when he, when he said to the, the, the church at Philippi, he, he told everyone to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You work out your relationship between God and you. That's between God and you. Don't worry about everyone else and the way they're figuring out their salvation. But you focus on yours. You, Peter, you just follow me. So what was next for the disciples was this restoration, this forgiveness of their failures and their sins. And I want to ask you, on this Sunday, this first Sunday, after Resurrection Sunday, maybe that's your next step. Maybe that's what's next for you. Maybe you're aware this morning of your failures, your shortcomings what you are as a result of just being human and being finite and being limited. And then maybe there's some, um, some here today or some who are listening today who, who are guilty of blatant disobedience. And maybe, uh, maybe, maybe you've grown weary uh, in, your, in your walk with the Lord. And maybe you've gotten off of the path and it's time to get back on the path. It's, it's time for your personal time of restoration and forgiveness. Jesus is as close to you this morning as he was to Peter around that warm fire that morning that he made breakfast. And all he wants to hear you say is, I love you. I love you, Lord. You know I love you. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my failures. The second thing that was next uh, for these disciples was not only the restoration of trust and love of their, of their calling and their followership, but the next thing was a new task. And this, this is the second uh, of the three events that happened between the resurrection and Pentecost. The new task was given. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. You've heard this all of your life from the missions department, right? Uh, the, the great commission, the great commission. Uh, when Jesus came to them and said, he said this, he told them the place to meet him on, 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 on a mountain area 
And, and he said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Remember that. that that's going to come up in the next couple of weeks again. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. You know, there are some people who say, well, all the authority is in the word. All the authority is in the Bible. Well, what happened here? There was no Bible. There was no Bible for 300 years after that. So where was the authority? The authority was in Jesus. When God raised him from the dead, he gave him all authority over sin and Satan and death and hell. All authority was in the risen Christ. And I know there is authority in the word of God. But if there is authority in the word of God, it's because God raised Jesus from the dead. And this book affirms it. Jesus at the right hand of God. That's where he is right now. Jesus still has all authority in heaven and earth. He's never relinquished his authority. Yes, there is authority in the word. Because the word affirms everything that Jesus said about himself. About his heavenly father. And in that, after that statement of authority, Jesus commissioned the 11 disciples who stood there. He said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. And then he commissioned them. He said, go therefore into all the world. And preach the gospel to every nation. He said, you are to baptize. You are to baptize believers in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And after that commissioning, the disciples began to refer to themselves as apostles. Because apostle means sent ones. The sent ones. They were not only the saved ones, the called ones, the restored ones. They were the sent ones. And that's where we get the name apostles. I am not an apostle. The church of the Nazarene calls me an elder. <laughs> and there are other churches that train leaders amongst the church and they call them elders. They're not pastors like the Nazarenes use that phrase, elder. But I am not an apostle. Uh, to me, that just sounds like something I don't. I don't really want to be. I, I don't think I'm capable. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy just calling myself a, a Christ follower, actually. I, I don't need a title um, or anything hanging on my wall that says I earned this or I'm to be called that. Uh, you can call me Pastor Gary or, or, or Gary if you so choose. <laughs> I'm, I'm a fellow Christ follower. But these disciples were apostles because they were sent. Well, guess what? You're sent. When you became born again, part, part of your life's mission became to tell the story of what happened to you over and over to others. You became a sent one. Someone... Someone um, paraphrased this Great Commission this way, and it makes sense. They paraphrased the Great Commission this way. Not just go, therefore, into all the world, but this way. In your going, in your going, 
make believers. In your going, make disciples of all nations and baptize them and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. In your going, that's for me and that's for you. That means wherever you go, in your going, if you go to Atlanta and you start a career and you, you get married and you have children and in your going, wh wherever you go, tell others about me and about you. See, that's my task and your task. That's everyone's task. We're not apostles. We're not even elders. Some of you are older, but you're not elder. Uh, but, but the task is the same, to tell others about Jesus, to help evangelize the world, share your faith. It's good news. It's good news. And if it's not good news, don't tell it. Keep it to yourself. <laughs> if it's not good news. Someone said the other day, if the gospel that you're hearing is not good news, then it's not the gospel. Think about that for a week or two. <laughs> we'll get to that also down the road. The new task was given. The third thing that happened was the empowerment for the new task. That's what happened on the day of Pentecost. That was what we celebrate in Acts chapter 1 as the birth of the new covenant. And I use those words carefully this morning because we have a we, we 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 Nazarenes have a way of kind of I think <clears throat> watering down this this day of Pentecost, this this filling uh, with the Holy Spirit of the 120 who were in that upper room. We, 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 we kind of reduce that down to, well, that was the second work of grace and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And we leave off the speaking in tongues thing because we don't like to deal with that. And so we just make it a personal thing. <clears throat> oh, yeah, well, that's evidence that after you're saved, well, I don't know if the disciples were saved or not before Pentecost. I know they were obedient and they were learning and they were growing. So I don't think we, I don't think we need to pigeonhole saved at this point, sanctified on the day of Pentecost. Well, if they were sanctified on the day of Pentecost, then they had to get re-sanctified again because they had to get refilled again, right? Several times. So I think we miss the beautiful and wonderful point when we try to make this just a personal thing i think we miss the wonderful point that on the day of pentecost post resurrection they obeyed what jesus said go into that upper room and pray get together get in one accord get your differences ironed out and when you're all in one accord the holy spirit is going to come and he's going to baptize you and they experienced that like flames of fire on everyone's heads and there were three obvious things that happened on the day of pentecost the the church of jesus christ was born that was the birth of the church and the rest of the book of acts is a description of the birth pains and the growing pains of the church of jesus christ the book of acts tells us about three things that was the result of pentecost it tells us about the power of the holy spirit these disciples who were cowards before the resurrection turned into bold messengers and bold sent ones who would not even back down from threats of the law to stop preaching the gospel. These men's lives were transformed by the power that Jesus told them to go into Jerusalem and wait for because that baptism of the Holy Spirit brought power from on high into their heart and into their life. 
the second thing that it brought to them was the very abiding presence of Jesus. The very presence of Jesus. When he said, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's what he was talking about. I'm going to be going away. And he disappeared right before them and went back to heaven. But his Holy Spirit came to rest upon them and abide within them. And on the day of Pentecost, he not only came to them in the Holy Spirit in power, but in his very abiding presence. And then there's another P. <laughs> this is a good three-point sermon within the sermon. But Peter, went in Acts chapter 15, verse 19, Verse 9, when he was describing to another group of people what happened on the day of Pentecost, he said, he said, God put no difference between us, he was talking about the Jews, and the Gentiles purifying our hearts by faith. They not only experienced the power of God, they experienced the presence of God, they experienced the purity that comes from being filled with the Spirit. Now, all of this is leading to a four letter word <laughs> that I'm going to use to develop a series of sermons in the next few weeks. All of this is leading up to what Peter and all the apostles. And the Apostle Paul began to teach and live out after Pentecost and after the resurrection. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16 through 19, Peter or Paul prayed that all the believers, all the followers after Jesus would be filled with, here's the word, love. So that you know how high, how deep, and how wide is the love of God. Peter's prayer, or Paul's prayer, was that you be filled with all the fullness of God. What is that? That's love. That was his prayer. That's what's next for us, is that we be filled with the fullness of of God. And what is that? That's you and I being full of the love of God. That's what Jesus revealed to us when he died on the cross for our sins. He revealed that he loves us. In Galatians chapter 5 verse 16, Paul reminds us again in another letter to another church. He said, let me remind you that all that matters, all that matters, that means the most important thing about your, your walk of faith is this, faith expressing itself in love, not the law. You see, some of those Galatian believers had been deceived by some people who came in from Jerusalem, uh, Judaizers. They were people who were converted out of Judaism, and they kept trying to teach, well, you are saved by grace through faith, but you got to keep part of the law. You got to wash your hands like this, and you got to be circumcised, and you got you to do certain things that the Jewish people have always done. Peter and Paul and James said, nope. Not going to have that. This is not Judaism 2.0. This is a brand new covenant. This is a new thing that Jesus is bringing to pass. And they separated. They separated the gospel of Jesus from those Old Testament requirements, from the law. And, and, and Paul began to teach that the law is fulfilled. All of the Old Testament law is fulfilled when you love one another. He made it simple. He simplified all of those 600 and some Old Testament laws. Jesus boiled it down to two. Love God. Love people. Peter, in 1 Peter 4, verse 7 through 8, 
He's writing to Christians who were under severe persecution. They were being killed. Their property was being confiscated. They would settle in one little town and the Romans would come in and burn down their homes. They would move to another place. And they were on the move. They were on the run for, for 300 years. And what does Peter write to them and say? He says, above all, above all. That sounds like the most important thing. Get this. Don't, don't miss this. Above all. And then he said, we're living in the end times. <laughs> The end of all things is near. So what's next? So love one another deeply. So that you can pray. Be sober minded. Don't let anything control your mind or your thinking. Don't let anything overpower um, the clarity of mind that God has given you so that you can live in the last days and you can be aware of your surroundings and you can love the brothers and sisters and you can pray. That's what's next. So in closing... Let's ask ourselves this question. What's next for me? Just celebrated Easter Sunday. What's next for me? Maybe what's next for you is to be restored. Maybe you need to get back in the race. Maybe you got sidelined by watching other people. Maybe you got sidelined because of your disappointment with God. And maybe getting back in the race is what's next for you. Maybe embracing the new task is what's next for you. You know what your new task is? There's only two things you have to remember. Your new task and my new task is love God, love people. That's it. Simple, right? Love God, love people. Put that on your mirror. <laughs> Put that on your refrigerator. My new task, love God, love people. Learn third Learn to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. Learn to love in the Spirit. Learn to serve one another because we love one another. What's next for me? Love, love, love. Amen. That's what's next for us. That, that, that's where we are right now, the church. That, that's where we are. And if we can figure out how to love, love, love. If we can figure out how to love God and love people, then we'll have a church here in five years, in 10 years, in 20 years. Because that's our calling. That's what Jesus told us to do. That's what he trained his disciples for three and a half years to hear and watch, then repeat over and over in the book of Acts. Love God, love people. I don't think church has to be complicated. I don't think we need to have five-hour board meetings until 11 o'clock at night and hammer out some new vision, some new mission, some, some phrase, because I, I don't think it's in the phrase. I think it's in the way you love God and the way you love people. And if you can do that and I can do that, 
then we'll have a church here. We'll, we'll, we'll have a church at Redland. And here's the, here's the bigger picture, is that, that God will have a church wherever he wants a church. <laughs> and nothing, not, not even the gates of hell, will, will, will keep it back, will hold it back. And if we can figure out how to love God and love people, we will have a church and, and, and you'll be blessed because of it. You'll be blessed because we participated in the plan of God. And your family will be blessed and your kids will be blessed and your grandkids will be blessed because we learned how to live and learn and love Love God and love people. It's really that simple. It really is. It's that simple. I need about five weeks to explain that, though, in, in sermons. But I promise you, I won't complicate it. Because I know already that when I said the word love, bombs were going off in your mind. You're like, oh, yeah, we need to be tough. We need to have tough love. That's what the world needs. Because I, I guarantee you that most of us in this room, when we talk about the church being love, we're like, oh, yeah, we've heard that. Just love, 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 love. I, I, I would say that if some of you were honest, and I found myself here about three years ago, I, I don't want to love. It takes too much energy. It takes too much prayer. And sometimes you have to fast to love people, right? It's work sometimes. I said it wasn't complicated. I didn't say it was easy. <laughs> but how about you? I'm ready. I'm ready to be the church that Jesus trained us and called us to be and I hope you are I gotta shut up Jesse come and <laughs> Jesse come and do the ending I'm just gonna turn it over to you for the closing how's that you, you just close it up and I'm sure that um, there's a chorus for us to sing with Jesse and I want to pray with you and then I'm so glad that Jesse is back and, and that can enable me to get to the door yes that will enable me to get to the door so I can shake your hand uh, on the way out. Father, thank you for the word, and I pray you'd bless it to our hearts. And help us in the weeks ahead as we contemplate uh, what it means to love God, to love people. Bring forgiveness to those this morning that that would be the first step back, is to be forgiven, be restored, and renewed in their walk with the Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Stand as we sing this chorus. Stand as we sing this chorus. Stand, please. Bye bye. <laughs> Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Jesus paid it all, all to him I own. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Yes, he washed it white as snow. Yes, he washed it white as snow. Amen. I'm going to leave you with this. Let us love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of his spirit. And may God's blessing be upon us and remain with us always. Amen. You are dismissed. Amen.